Welcome everyone. My name is Blake and I will be your moderator this evening. Tonight, I'm excited to welcome Dr. Wong for a step-by-step -step approach to gum grafts. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to go over some housekeeping. If you have a question, please type it in the Q&A section and we will answer them live at the end. Henry Shine is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand. Dr. Wong, welcome and I will pass it over to you now. Hey, thank you so much, Blake. It's good to uh, finally meet you as well. So she's kind of the, the person behind the scenes that it kind of makes all this happen. Um, thank you all for, for uh, taking the time to do another yet another webinar with me. Uh, today we're talking about CBCT in action again, but we're going to give it a little bit of a twist. We're gonna talk about gum grafts and CBCTs. And prior to this, I was getting a lot of messages from people that were that were asking me like, what do gum grafts and CBCT, like they don't get the correlation. So what I thought I'd do today is, is talk about the differences in, in grafting soft tissue, the differences between grafting teeth versus implants, because in one, Scenario, you don't need a CBCT, obviously, with teeth, but with implants, it's a really, really good idea. So let's go ahead and talk about that. Um, some of these cases, by the way, you'll see, um, you may have seen them before you know, on a different topic. So it's a, my way of kind of tying everything in together. So hopefully it, it all makes sense uh, to everybody. Now, most of you all know me, but for those who don't, uh, one really good way to keep in touch with me is through Instagram. I've got two accounts. My personal account is just david.wong.dds. Uh, but my surgical account where all the cases and, and details and questions um, that I answer about, about, you know, perio and stuff uh, is uh, my account called Plaque China. So follow me there if you want. As far as, you know, me being qualified to teach you guys anything at all, um, in addition to being a periodontist, I do, you know, one of my passions is writing and speaking about, you know, periodontics and implants. So hopefully you'll get something out of this today. So. Goals for today, uh, what I want to talk about really is the, uh, the big thing is, is the difference between grafting around teeth versus implants. That's kind of the take home that I want to give for you all. We're going to talk about the common graft materials and try to demystify some of that because there's a, obviously a, a lot of different ways uh, to accomplish similar results. And you may or may not, you know, you know, want one graft material versus another. We're going to talk about different flap designs between teeth versus implants. And then I want to talk about the rationale for various graph materials so that we can, so I can hopefully help, help you decide, you know, what is the best surgical approach for, for you. So the big thing here, and then many of you have seen this slide before, um, when we compare the anatomy of a natural tooth versus a dental implant, the biggest thing I want to point your attention to is that unlike uh, natural teeth, implants obviously do not have a periodontal ligament because you have osseo integration between the implant surface and the bone. But the other big thing that applies to gum grafting is that uh, when we look at the connective tissue fibers, I'm going to nerd out a little bit here. When we look at the connective tissue fibers uh, between the soft tissue and the surface of a tooth or an implant, and the uh, connective tissue fibers for an implant are oriented parallel uh, to the implant surface, whereas on a natural tooth that are inserted perpendicular. That's really important because the implication is, is that the soft tissue cuff around a, a, around a dental implant is a little bit weaker, so we try to pay a little bit more attention to the soft tissue thickness and also the quality, like whether or not it's keratinized. So when we look at similar mucogingival defects and recession around the teeth versus an implant, what are the big differences? Um, so for me, I'd much rather treat teeth and hopefully you guys would too, because if you're sending an implant to a periodontist for grafting around an implant, something, something bad has happened. Right. Uh, whereas with teeth, you know, uh, something bad's happened because of that person, you know, brushes too hard or, you know, grinds or clenches their teeth or something like that. But the true definition of a muco, you know, mucogingival surgery or periodontal plastic surgery or oral plastic surgery, those are all synonymous terms, by the way. The biggest, the uh, the official uh, definition is that they are plastic surgical procedures for the uh, correction of abnormal gingival mucous membrane relationships. Or uh, they can also be performed as an adjunct to regular pocket elimination or pocket reduction therapy, independent of those types of surgeries for the purpose of widening the zone of attached gingiva. All that is to say, um, 
mucogingival surgery or oral plastic surgery or periodontal plastic surgery addresses recession or thin gums. And that's really it. Okay. So that's, that's kind of what that is in a nutshell. So when we look at, you know, the rationale for why we even do any type of mucogingival surgery, it, it's based on the idea that you need around an implant or a natural tooth that you need two millimeters of keratinized tissue and one millimeter of attached gingiva around that tooth or implant for optimal gingival health. It doesn't mean that the tooth or implant is going to fall out if you don't have two millimeters, but it's just saying for optimal health. Um, reduced or absent uh, attached gingiva may be due to several factors. One, of course, is periodontal disease. If you've got a, you know, bacteria infiltration and you get pocket formation, you know, that pocket can go below the mucogingival junction, which by, by definition, that's a, that's a mucogingival defect. Anatomically, we may have some freedom attachments or pulls uh, that pulls that tissue down off, the, off of the facial surface of the tooth or the implant. And you may also have just recession from toothbrush abrasion. It can be occlusion. It can be parafunctional activity or what, you know, whatever that is. So a lot of different factors that, that lead to recession or thin gum tissue. So what are we exactly you know, trying to accomplish here? Um, what we're trying to fix, let's see if my little pointer will work. Number one is we're trying to correct the lack of keratinized or attached tissue. We also want to eliminate high freedom attachments. We want to get root or implant coverage if possible. We want to correct any gingival deformities. If they, things aren't nice and smooth and scalloped the way we want, we want to correct those. So this would be a prime example of a mucogingival deficiency around a natural teeth, the lower incisor area. It's, if you see this on Instagram and social media, on periodontist uh, pages all the time, this is like the most common thing that we see, uh, recession on lower incisors. So before we address, you know, what, what, you know, how to, how to address a mucogingival defect like this, one thing that might be helpful for you is learning just the basic Miller classification of gingival recession. And I don't really get into uh, classification systems all that much, but it, the, the take home point here is that when, I, when I'm talking to patients, I tell them there's four classifications of recession or four stages of recession. You want to be class one. You don't want to be class four. And the reason that is, is because when you have class one recession, you just have a little bit of the root exposed. It's not going past that mucogingival junction where things can really explode. But the big thing here is that you don't have any bone loss between your teeth. When that is the case, you can get up to 100% root coverage. So that's class one, and you want to be a class one. If you're class two, all that means is that you have a little bit more recession than, than the uh, first class, and that recession can extend now to that mucogingival line. And I'll show the patient that line, you know, where the where you have really pink tissue versus really loose red tissue. Um, and class two is okay. You know, at, at class one or class two, we're still good. And the reason we're still good is because we still don't have any uh, bone loss interproximal. Now, class three is where it gets bad. Class three is when you start to lose that interdental bone. And that's important because once you lose that bone, you can only get 50 to 75% root coverage. And in that situation, you may want to change the type of procedure you're considering. Class four recession, you're kind of at the mercy of, of you know, the patient's healing and their anatomy, because at that, at that point, the recession extends beyond the mucogingival junction. Matter of fact, the, the uh, bone loss, you know, has, has, is so bad that it's actually further down, further apical than the uh, root, the, than the uh, root recession. So in that situation, we can't get any root coverage. Okay. We can't expect to cover any of the root at all. So we're going to have to change our, or rethink our goals there. So the key thing in knowing the whole Miller classification of recession or any classification of recession is going to be, where is the bone? That's the question you always have to ask yourself is where is the bone, especially the inner dental bone. So when we look at this lower incisor area, once again, what are the things that we're really looking at? So in this situation, as an example, you know, I'm seeing a high freedom attachment. I'm seeing some recession on both central incisors, even at, uh, the lateral incisors as well. When we see those black triangles between the teeth, we know that we have some interdental bone loss. There's calculus present, which is contributing to that uh, marginal inflammation. So these are some things that we look at. Now, when we look at upper recession, it looks a little bit different, doesn't it? 
We don't necessarily have a high frena pool. The tissue is already pink and healthy. It looks pretty thick. So really the only problem here is that we have root exposure. So these are two different things. And sometimes I feel like you should have two different approaches, if not three or four different approaches, uh, just depending on the, on the scenario and what your skill set is. As far as graft materials go, there's always a debate with periodontists and also, you know, general dentists who, who like surgery, uh, between how do I know when to use a free gingival graft, which includes the epithelium and the underlying connective tissue, or a connective tissue graft, or an acellular dermal graft. So these are all three, you know, viable options when we're considering you know, soft tissue grafting around teeth and implants. So how do you, how do you plan that? The, the thing that I'm going to tell you, and, and you guys have heard this a trillion times before, is that if you fail to plan, you are planning to fail. That famous quote from Benjamin Franklin applies, especially in periodontal plastic surgery, because a lot of times you have to, you, and I'm going to say you have to, you, you really need to think about the flat design uh, and how the tissues are going to behave before you do anything, you know, before you, uh, you know, make an incision or anything like that. So, so the questions you have to ask yourself when it comes to gingival recession around teeth and implants is what are the goals of treatment? Is it root coverage? Is it, do we just want a thicker biotype? Do we need more keratinization? Do we just, are we just trying to eliminate a freedom pool? You know, are, is the patient uncomfortable? Do they just want to, you know, want teeth to chew with? Uh, or, or are we, you know, looking more, you know, for cosmetics, you know? So we need to know all these things because that's how we're going to plan what type of graft and what type of flat design we're going to utilize. The question, if, if it's an aesthetic case, you've got to figure out, can I get root coverage? And the answer to that, like we just talked about, is going to be where is the interdental height of bone or the interproximal height of bone? Um, the question that I have for, for you know, my colleagues out there is, do you need more keratinized or attached gingiva? If the answer is yes, that's going to be one type of graft. If the answer is no, that's another type of graft. And we're going to walk through cases uh, so I can show you this. You know, how, what is your skill set like? Because some of these cases are going to be very, very technique sensitive, you know, depending on, you know, the vestibular depth, freedom pulls, tissue thickness. So you have to kind of know yourself, you know, what, what works really well in your hands and also how some of these materials work as well, because some things work a lot, are, are a lot more forgiving than others. So when we're talking about soft tissue grafting, you know, what I like to consider, I like to, think that, you know, I, I like to manage cases, right? Um, but as a periodontist, I can tell you, I spent probably more than half my time rescuing cases. And when we're talking about a management situation, we're talking about class one and class two recession. You know, these are things where, you know, the patient has optimum uh, anatomical traits, an optimal scenario to where I can get a, a nice, you know, up to 100% outcome. Contrast that with implants sometimes, you know, like I said, if, if, if I'm getting referred uh, a soft tissue case for an implant, that means something bad has happened. So I don't think I'm really in a management situation anymore. I'm more in a rescue type situation. Unfortunately, this webinar is going to be too, too short for me to walk over to go over everything. So I'm going to go over the basics and, and teach you guys you know, uh, how to diagnose and treatment plan. And then we'll, we'll go with we'll go from there. But with free gingival grafts, you know, why do we do those? Because a lot of times when you when you talk to people, they're like, oh, they're ugly. You know, they're big, thick and patchy. It just looks like just a big wad of tissue, like a piece of bubble gum or a tire patch. You know, why would anybody want that? Well, I can tell you, if you're new to grafting and if you've ever taken a course from me, like hands on or anything like that, one of the first things that we're going to teach you is a free gingival graft. And that is basic, you know, in, uh, basic, you know, periodontist 101. And the reason that it is periodontics 101 is because free gingival grafts are very predictable and they're simple. Um, they're not very technique sensitive. If, if suturing is not your thing, you're going to want to learn how to do a free gingival graft. You know, if having really steady hands and, and, and delicate flat designs, if, if that's not your thing, you're going to want to learn how to do a free gingival graft. Um, you can gain a massive amount of keratinized and attached gingiva, and really, it's the it's the best and most predictable way to address a freedom pull. So, if a freedom pull is is something that is just absolutely your nemesis right now that you're battling, you got to learn how to do a free gingival draft. 
The downside with free gingival grafts is that root coverage is not always so predictable. So you have to figure out, you know, if I don't cover 100% of this root, is that a deal breaker for, for me or for the patient? Um, when I say simple suturing, I mean, free gingival grafts are often not very pretty, you know, whenever you suture them, because we literally just, you know, outline a rectangular piece of tissue from the palate. It's about a millimeter and a half to two millimeters thick. And then we just place it over the mucogingival defect after we prepare the bed and everything. But it's simple suturing. It's, it's interrupted sutures and, and maybe, maybe a sling suture. Um, you can place the graft directly on the bone or the periosteum, and it works. I mean, these things work almost 100% of the time. Um, you don't have to suture the uh, lateral borders like you see here. I haven't sutured the sides and, and the bottom part. I just leave it wide open. And what you're going to notice is that when it heals, it heals beautifully. You know, I, and I say beautifully, you know, for a periodontist. Some people are still like, that still looks ugly. But for a periodontist, this looks great. You have a lot of keratinized and attached gingiva. It's pink and healthy. In spite of the patient having, you know, less than optimum uh, oral hygiene, the tissue looks awesome. Um, this is stable. I mean, we'll take a picture of this thing in 20, 30, 40 years, and it's probably going to look the exact same because nothing is more stable than a, than a free gingival graft. Now, so if you look at a case like this, you know, for me, this is like a no brainer. You know, we have a very shallow vestibule. We have a really, really strong freedom pull right on the facial surface of that, of the central incisor. Uh, we have interproximal bone loss, so I can't get hundred percent root coverage anyway. Uh, patient's hygiene isn't that great and we just need thicker tissue. And so, so when we're talking to the patient and they're like, I don't care about aesthetics. I really don't even care about the root being exposed. I just don't want to lose my tooth. If that's the case, then, then we're doing a free gingival graft. And, and you can see why. In, in the after result, there's that, yes, tire patch appearance. But once again, with when it comes to comparing graft materials and techniques, nothing gets you thicker and, and more keratinized and attached gingival than a free gingival graft. And it's not even close. So when we when we're uh, battling with you know people with periodontal disease, poor oral hygiene, things like that, you know I say a free gingival graft. Now that's what I say. Uh, there's plenty of studies to support you know the use of other graft materials for this area, and that's fine. But I'm telling you, predictability and longevity. This is where it's at. It's a free gingival graft. Now. When would I use connective tissue? Let, let's look at that. So we're going to look at the same exact area again, just because it's so um, it's so common recession on lower incisors. So here we've got a, a gentleman. He's he's got generalized recession across the lower incisors. We do have a, a moderately high freedom pool, but it's not right on the facial surface like those other cases. It's kind of just there, right? We have class two recession. We don't have black triangles, so we have lots of interproximal uh, height of bone to work with. The tissue is really pink and healthy, but it is on the thinner side, but it's not crazy thin. It's just thin. So in this situation, if the patient says, hey, I really want the root covered or I have, you know, uh, root sensitivity to cold or whatever, then you're going to want to do a connective tissue graft. Now, why would you want to do a connective tissue graft? Number one, when you harvest a connective tissue graft, it comes from the middle layer underneath the epithelium of the part of the palate. So what that means is they won't have this big gaping wound in the, in the roof of their mouth. So it hurts a lot less. So that, that's good for patients. But uh, number two, unlike free gingival grafts, with connective tissue grafts, you can get more predictable root covers. So if you want to get the root up, the the, uh, the tissue up higher on the root surface and cover that exposed root. Connective tissue grafts are, are what you want to go, are, are what you're going to want to choose here. So here's how we close that connective tissue graft. Now with a connective tissue graft, you can leave a portion of that graft exposed, and what will happen to that exposed portion is that it will eventually lead to keratinized tissue. So. With connective tissue grafts, because it's autogenous tissue, comes from the, the patient's own body, you don't have to get complete coverage of the graft if you don't want to. So let me show you what, what that turns into. So here's your before, and then here's your after, right? So what you're going to notice in the, in the after is that the tissue is thicker than it was, but 
the Freena pool is relieved. It's not gone. So you can still see the Freena pool. It's not gone, but it's definitely not as big a force. And then you'll notice that the tissue is thicker. You know, we're, talk, we're talking about uh, buccal lingually. And then it's also higher to address any root sensitivity and maybe aesthetics if it, if it bothers them uh, cosmetically. Now, you'll notice, though, the band of keratinized gingiva is not near as, as, as wide as it is with a free gingival graft, but you have the benefit of root coverage. So when you compare a free gingival graft versus a connective tissue graft, with a free gingival graft, you get less predictable root coverage, but you get a larger increase in keratinized and, and attached gingiva. There's also a better elimination of freedom attachments. It's less technique sensitive, has a higher success rate for sure, especially for beginning uh, surgeons. Um, but the downside with free gingival grafts, once again, is there's it's less predictable as far as the root coverage. The other downside, or maybe I should flip it and look at the positive, the upside of a connective tissue graft is that you can do a variety of different things with the flap designs. As an example, if you look at um, this you know, 10, 10 millimeter recession defect on that mesiofacial root of number 14 here, you know, with a free gingival graft, yeah, I mean, there is a mucogingival defect, the tissue is thin, but if I were to just do a free gingival graft, at best, at best, I'm expecting, you know, 50% of that root covered, which is still leaving that patient with like five millimeters of root exposed, which isn't good. So we cross that off the list. On the other hand, with a connective tissue graft, how do you get that tissue to come all the way down? I know you, I just told you, you don't have to you know, cover the entire graft material, but it'd be a good idea to cover most of it. So in that situation, we had the option of doing a lateral sliding pedicle graft. So here is the, my flap design, where we're going to borrow the flap tissue from the bicuspid number 13, and we're going to slide it distally over number 14. But we're going to add a wrinkle to that. We're going to add a piece of connective tissue from the roof of the mouth, and we're going to transplant that right over the facial surface of number 13, because that way when we rob that number 13 of that, of that flap or that soft tissue, we got to replace it, okay? So we're going to replace it with this graft, but we're also going to put uh, the graft material over that mesial buccal root and suture it up. That middle photo here is is what it looks like uh, when we at the two week uh, post op when we take out the sutures, and then towards the end here you'll you'll notice that that's that's what the tooth looks like in about a year. So um, very very you know a lot more flexibility with flat designs when you use a connective tissue graft. Whereas with free gingival grafts, you kind of just get one thing. What about acellular dermal grafts? So what, what happens if a patient says, you know what, I am like a dental phobe. You're not cutting anything out of the roof of my mouth. I'm afraid about, of pain and anxiety, yada, yada, yada. I don't want to do any of that stuff. What about acellular dermal grafts? So when we're talking about acellular dermal grafts, what that is, it's, it's cadaver tissue. So when you're talking to patients, it's just in a nutshell, it's cadaver tissue. It's deproteinized and there's no cellular activity in it. They can't get any, you know, uh, transmittable diseases or anything like that. So it's safe and easy to use. But is it a good idea for them? So that's one thing we have to look at. With acellular dermal grafts, um, it's nice because it doesn't hurt the patient. It just comes straight out from a package. So they don't have to have the second surgical site from the palate. Um, but they're mostly designed for root coverage and to also thicken the tissue a little bit, okay? You don't usually get a whole lot of uh, increased in, increase in keratinized uh, tissue. You do get an increase in attached tissue, but that attached tissue is not keratinized. So when you would use acellular dermal grafts or ADGs, you would use those in situations where you value root coverage, and you don't, and the tissues over the surrounding tissue is already moderately thick. So really, you're talking about class one and class two type recession defects. Uh, the other thing with these is that you can't, they're hard to treat or use the ADG when you have a high freedom pool. So that's why in a situation like this, you'll notice that we tunnel underneath that papilla. So this influences your flat design because you're going to want to tunnel underneath the freedoms instead of release the freedom. Um, and the reason that is for two reasons. 
One is you cannot leave an acellular dermal graft exposed to the oral cavity because it will slough and die. And usually it'll, it'll have this terrible smell. And most importantly, it won't work. Okay, that part of the graft does not work. Um, there will be reports that you'll see in literature where, you know, you'll see somebody that says, oh, I can get it to work. But generally speaking, ADGs have to be completely covered in order to work. So that's a disadvantage if you're not used to flat manipulation. Um, the other thing is that you already have to have, you know, adequately thick tissue. So if you don't have that, you may want to consider using autogenous tissue or something else. Okay. Uh, the other hard part, uh, for, so I would say for beginners, uh, this is kind of a hard one to learn just because you have to get complete coverage of the graph material. And it's also got to be a uh, tension free uh, closure. So you can't have, you know, when at the end of this procedure, I'll pull the you know patients live up and down and sideways. We don't want to see any of that, any of that marginal gingival move. So and that's really important. So this is what it looks like at two weeks post-op. And then this is what it looks like when we're finally done. Now, you know, the, the, the hard part here is that the tissue was already, you know, decently thick, so we didn't get a whole lot of thickness, but you'll notice that we got more root coverage, and that's kind of what, what we uh, were trying to gain here. The lower left canine, eh, still has maybe half a millimeter, millimeter of, of uh, uh, root exposure left, but you know, it, it's okay. So the bottom line here is that for mandibular incisors, you know, I would say free gingival grafts are a common first choice, uh, usually because it's a, it's not in the aesthetic zone. Nobody really sees your lower teeth when you smile or laugh or talk. Um, the other thing is it's a delicate area to work in. The tissue is commonly very, very thin. Uh, you usually have that middle uh, midline freedom pull, and usually that tissue is not cared for. So I would say a free gingival graft is, is the most common choice for, I would say, a lot of periodontists, but certainly, you know, a general dentists who are in the early stages of their learning curve. So. I just put together just, uh, eight random cases here. Uh, these are all befores and afters, but I, I typically will use a free gingival graft in this area. Uh, you'll notice the case with the braces. You know, for ortho, I almost exclusively do free gingival grafts because I'm counting on kids to have poor oral hygiene around those brackets. And, you know, the, the orthodontist is going to be pushing and, and shoving those teeth around. I want to make sure that we have plenty of thick tissue for, uh, so that they can do that. With maxillary teeth, it's a little bit different, um, a lot easier. So when when you, I showed you guys this case earlier, with maxillary teeth, it's a lot a lot different because you have usually there's you're, you're in the aesthetic zone. Fortunately, you have a, a steeper vestibule; it's not real shallow. Uh, freedom pulls are are less strong, and and there's usually fewer freedom pulls. Um, usually, the the big chief complaint here is either root sensitivity or I don't like the way it looks. You know, the cosmetic situation. So when that's the case, you can do whatever flap design you want. You know, you can do an envelope flap. You can use vertical incisions. You can do a tunnel. Uh, you can do whatever you want to do, and it's probably going to work. So in this situation, fortunately, as long as you're dealing with class one and class two recession, you have all the options. You, know, you, can, you have the whole playbook at your disposal. So choose whatever your favorite. But the results will still be dependent on the interproximal height of bone. So in a case like this, I'll show you how I like to do it. In this situation, because we're working on, what, six, seven teeth, I'm not going to use the patient's you know, palate at all because I, I, I want them to still you know, have a decent experience and want to come back and not be afraid of the dentist. So I'll use an acellular dermal graft. Now, you'll notice the strength of that you know, midline freedom. I'll tunnel underneath that because I don't want to uh, create a black triangle in that area if I can help it. So... I try to whenever I can for the uh, midline papilla on the on the uh, upper arch. I'll try to leave that intact. And then once again, the rule with ADGs is you got to completely cover uh, cover the uh, graft material if we want it to work. So this is what it looks like at two weeks, and then here we are uh, with our final result. This, by the way, is it is it at about a year as well. So there's our before, and there's our after. Um, just a real quick reminder, I'm not trying to sell you guys a bunch of stuff, but I do answer a lot of uh, messages that it's kind of hard sometimes. We, Dr. Curry Levin and I do a two-day course 
and they're they're doing a thing right now till July 31st. It's 1,795 bucks. It's a two day hands-on live surgery course. You get to see Dr. Levitt uh, uh, do a surgery. Uh, we do the pig jaw labs. We, we teach you everything uh, that you would need to know as far as, you know, free gentle grafts and just basic you know, root covered surgery on the soft tissue side. But also we do socket grafting and, and an, introductory, an introduction to guided bone regeneration and ridge augmentations as well. But that's a nice little two day course. We just did one last month. Uh, had about 30 people and it was really good. Um, so we still, we just now open up this date. It's September 15th and 16th. So um, if you're interested, just send me a message and and I'll uh, make sure I get you that information. But I feel like it's the personally the best value out there for CE. Um, what about grafting around implants? So this is where the CBCD comes in because with teeth, you, you know what you're getting with teeth. Right? You peel back the tissue, you're going to see a root, right? With implants, you peel back the tissue, you, you're going to see an implant, you, you could see maybe a, a, an abutment, you could see titanium, you could see, uh, I don't know, zirconia, you, you don't know what you're going to see, right? So with these, that's why I recommend really, really planning these out before you cut anything at all. So when it comes to implant aesthetics, you guys have seen uh, maybe, the, maybe this article before, but there's four factors that affect implant aesthetics. Um, number one is the existing gingival levels. So how your implant's going to look is gonna, really going to depend a lot on how the other teeth look and, and uh, what, what the mouth and occlusion looks like. Um, teeth and gums, they do things. And implants, they do things once, you've, you, know, once, once you make an incision you know, around them. And how they respond to your surgery or your restorative procedure is going to help determine you know, your, you know, how your implant's going to look. Where you place an implant depth, position, angulation, that's going to influence, you know, what the final restoration looks like. And finally, you know, how you decide to restore the tooth, um, how you design the abutment, how you design the, the crown, the embrasure spaces, the contour, subcritical contour, all those things play a role in how an implant is going to look. So when we look at teeth versus implants, for me, Grafting around, grafting on a tooth surface like dentin or cementum, that's super duper easy. Grafting an implant surface that's titanium, that's exposed to the oral cavity, that's very, very difficult. Um, are the interproximal bone levels around teeth or implants more likely to be better? You know, once again, teeth win this. You know, usually the teeth have better interproximal height of bone because the implants are commonly buried, right? Buried, and uh, depending on the implant design, that bone goes with that, with that implant uh, platform. Uh, the papilla size, it, it does matter because if we if we want to, you know, characterize a tooth or an implant as as having good aesthetics, we commonly look to the papilla. So our papilla easier to to uh, preserve or, or um, create around teeth or implants. <laughs> Once again, it's teeth. And what about the location of the CEJ? You know, the CEJ around teeth is very predictable. We can all kind of estimate, you know, what, what as an example, what a central incisor a CEJ looks like and where it's going to be. Around an implant crown, I don't know. You know, we, we don't really know sometimes. So when we're talking about soft tissue management or rescue around implants, uh, here's a few, you know, helpful tips that I'm going to give you here for the next, you know, 20 minutes or so. So here we've got a case where I just like I showed you with the lower incisors uh, on natural teeth. These that area is notorious for gingival recession, okay? Because the tissue's thin, you have a high free pull, pull, et cetera, et cetera. So what do you do now when those teeth are gone and you have to place? implants right how do you prevent the implants from having that same the, the same problem as teeth so here, here's how i do so the question you have to ask yourself is is soft tissue grafting indicated in this situation we know we need bone if you look at the occlusal surface here we know we're deficient in bone but do we need tissue and the short answer for me is yes you do okay if you can help it you want more keratinized gingiva or tissue around around an implant but what does the literature say? So how important is keratinized tissue in the literature? We commonly assume that keratinized gingiva around implants is associated with less inflammation, less bleeding, less plaque accumulation, 
less recession and less crystal bone loss around the implant. Now, we, when we look at these studies, um, this is a study in overdenture, and what they looked at was the quality of the tissue around overdenture abutments. And they discovered that when, when you have less than two millimeters of keratinized gingiva, you had increased recession, increased clinical attachment level loss, you know, more plaque accumulation around the abutments, uh, you had, which meant more inflammation and more bleeding on probing. Uh, when we look at a systematic review, this is from, uh, from my uh, one of my buddies here, uh, who's the chair of perio at, at the University of Iowa. Um, look at this. So uh, when they had less than two millimeters of keratinized gingiva, this is across all qualified studies that they were you know, including in their review. Uh, the keratinized tissue uh, had higher plaque index, higher gingival index, which just means more inflammation. They bled more, but they had, the pockets weren't affected at all. And they were inconclusive about uh, implant survival. But in this situation, just like all systematic reviews, they concluded that there was not enough information to conclude the value of keratinized mucosa. However, you know, two millimeters, once again, seems to be, you know, the magic number here. Uh, when we look at a prospective study um, looking at the importance of keratinized tissue, once again, uh, when you look at these studies, uh, unfortunately, they, they commonly conclude there's the, that the lack of keratinized gingiva does not really compromise the, the longevity of, of the implant. Uh, this study was really kind of cool, though, because it says aesthetically patients pre prefer the, the appearance of keratinized tissue um, around the implant. So that, that's something that's going to play out. Uh, in this presentation here in a few minutes. So I won't bore you with a bunch of studies, but I will say, you know, I, I looked at about 12 or so, and six of the studies said that um, keratinized tissue is really important. The other six was like, it's inconclusive, or, you know, the answer was no. So, but I would say as a periodontist, you know, who treats gingival recession around implants all the time, I, I believe uh, keratinized gingiva is very important for long-term implant health. Now, what about the biotype? You know, how, how important is a biotype? So when I say biotype, all I'm all I'm saying is, is that tissue thick or thin? And I don't mean this way. We're talking about this way. Is it thick or thin? So the benefits of thick of a thick biotype uh, is the same as having keratinized tissue. You're, it's commonly associated with less recession, less inflammation. And uh, when it comes to bone grafting and things like that, uh, according to several studies, the benefits of having a thicker, uh, have, having thicker tissue, you get improved vascularity and graft stability for your bone augmentation procedures. So, um, for that reason, when we talk about, you know, do you do soft tissue grafting first or bone grafting first? Typically, you'll see me do uh, soft tissue grafting first. Not that that's the only way to do it. What about vertical gingival thickness? So this is something that we look at nowadays. If you guys uh, follow zero bone loss concepts or, or uh, Dr. Thomas Linkovicious on Instagram, he talks a lot about zero bone loss concepts. And one of, one of the concepts, there are several of them, but one of the concepts is the vertical uh, tissue height over the implant. So after you place your implant, if you look at your probe, you know, how, how thick is that, is that tissue? And they've discovered that the thicker the vertical tissue is, you have less bone loss, which is important. It has important implications for uh, gingival recession and, and uh, uh, clinical attachment level loss. So um, when we look at all the different options that we've talked about so far, we've talked about free gingival grafts, connective tissue grafts, and acellular dermal grafts. When you combine those three with the various flat designs and things like that, you kind of get this mess that's on the right side of your screen that I wrote for uh, uh, this textbook uh, called Implant Aesthetics. So you get this whole kind of mess thing here because, because when you have all the different variations, there's a lot of different ways that you can fix uh, a multitude of problems. So one thing when we're talking about implants and soft tissue health, it's important to, to focus on health first. And that means we don't want inflammation. We don't want bleeding on probing. We want it to be, you know, uh, maintainable by the patient so they can brush it without pain. They can eat without pain. Uh, we want to make sure that the patients are comfortable, uh, functional. And, and uh, lastly, you know, we want it to look good. 
But I've always contended that, you know, when, when we put health first, when tissues look healthy, they also look aesthetically pleasing as well. And I'll walk you through that scenario here. So going back to this case, I chose to do a free gingival graft first, you know, based on this old article from my friends, uh, uh, actually friend, Dr. Henry Salama. I've never met Jay Siever before, but I know Henry really well. But back in June 96, they made uh, alluded to this recommendation to graft early because of the, the uh, association with less recession and inflammation. So um, let's flash forward here. We're going to do a free gingival graft took it from the palate, and we're going to place it right over the area of our future augmentation. Once again, it doesn't have to be sutured very nice, nicely or neatly. It, it's going to work. This is what it looks like at two weeks post-op. And then once we place our, do our augmentation in our implants, I wanted to show you what the final restorations look like. Look at how thick that tissue is. It's tremendously thick. That tissue is going to go nowhere. Uh, I feel good about the function and comfort and health of this uh, and longevity for this patient. I don't worry about this case at all. It does not keep me up at night. So that's with a free gingival graft followed by an augmentation and an implant with an implant bridge. And as you can see, eight years later, I stopped this uh, following this case after 2015. You see no difference. What about managing a failed implant site? So this is a situation, you know, you have a failed implant tooth number, uh, implant number nine. There's a fenestration in the soft tissue, which is also, you know, see this, it's thin, non-keratinized, uh, thin biotype, no attached tissue, right? So when you look at a CBCT, and this is why it's important, right? Because there are cases like this where, you know, maybe, maybe I would choose to do a soft tissue graft but not with a CAT scan like this, right? When a third of your implant is, is sticking out of the bone or two thirds of the implant sticking out of the bone, I don't want any part of this with the soft tissue graft with the implant in place, but I want every bit of a soft tissue graft once we take the implant out. So the reason I did that is if you look at the, key, the CT scan, this patient is going to need more bone on the facial aspect. So, uh, I can't do that with a hole in the tissue. So what we're going to do is take that implant out and we'll place a free gingival graft right over the facial surface of, of that, of the bone there. Now, some people will say, well, you could have just let it heal in by itself. And that that's probably true. But the problem with that is it would be less care. You know, it wouldn't be keratinized and it'd be really thin again. So uh, I didn't want to risk that. So while I'm already taking the implant out, we might as well place a free gingival graft at the same time. And this is what that looks like. So now uh, we can go through here and we can talk uh, GBR at a different time. Um, if you want, we can always talk about GBR. Uh, matter of fact, if you guys are going to Thrive Live, sponsored by Henry Shine next month, that is my topic. It's, it's actually GBR and, and membrane. So uh, when you guys see the ads or the uh, invitation to, to get out there, go out to Vegas. That's going to be a really good one. I think and I, I, it's not next month. It's actually uh, first week of May. So anyway, be on the lookout for that. So here we have enough tissue now. This is what it looks like in two weeks. But now we have enough tissue so that we can add our bone. Um, I'll, I'm going to skip over my bone grafting protocol for now just so you guys can enjoy the 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 rest of this case here. So we've got the bone graft in place, and then we're going to tie in our membranes around, um, around the bone graft material so that we have good stability and space maintenance. And then we're going to close that up, but see the difference here now. Now, when it's closed up, you can see the value of that keratinized and attached gingiva. It's really important that we have that so we don't you know, get a perforation through the thin tissue. We don't want a bunch of particles sticking out and then, you know, eventually, you know, getting, uh, uh, getting uh, oozing out of the flap or anything like that. So that, that can happen when you have a thin tissue or a thin flap. This does not happen when you have nice thick tissue like this. So here we're going to go to our uh, surgical plan. We've got a, an implant placed uh, virtually, and you can see we place a nice size implant and still have two millimeters of bone to the facial. And this is our goal here. The implant's going to be placed in the perfect spot. We're going to go ahead and, and uh, take a scan at the time of the implant placement. That way, when we go to uncover it, I'll already have a provisional crown made. 
and we can place it at the same time. Now, uh, fortunately, the patient also wants you know his other teeth fixed and that type of stuff. He didn't really like the way his teeth appeared anyway, so I put his provisional on, got him back to his uh, restorative dentist, and then two years later, he actually I talked him into coming back so I could take a look at it, and you can still see the, uh, the free gingival graft is still present, and this is his before and this is his after. So. You can see a, a nice difference in soft tissue management, but also the importance of planning ahead and, and the importance of utilizing that, that CBCT. Um, as we end here, we're gonna talk about gingival recession around implants that we're not gonna take out. So I will say this, this case, a lot of times people don't fess up to their, to their implant complications. I'm gonna fess up to this. These two implants were placed by me, okay? I placed these implants in 2005. Um, 2005, 2006, I can't remember when, but um, I know it was one of those two years. Here you're going to see that the implants are placed okay, they're parallel, but there's a debate now whether or not I should have placed one or two implants. There's also a debate whether or not any soft tissue grafting should have been done at the same time. Either way, I did two implants and I didn't do any soft tissue grafting. But now the problem is that we have no keratinized tissue. Um, we have a, a bunch of freedom pulls and, you know, the implants are integrated. So they're, they're going to stay. I mean, we're not going to start explaining, you know, lower incisor implants because that would probably be more damaging. So we have a choice to make. Do we do a connective tissue graft or do we do a free gingival graft? And now what I said earlier when I introduced this pyramid is we want to focus on the patient's health. You know, so what's going to be healthier for the patient? Forget aesthetics. What's going to be more healthier? And in that situation, it's got to be a free gingival graft for the reasons that I, I talked to before. You want thicker tissue. You want keratinized tissue. And we've got to get those freedom pulls off of that marginal tissue. So that's what I did. A free gingival graft. And you're going to notice what it looks like at two weeks. And with, it's placed submarginally, meaning that we don't reflect a flap over this. And that's important as well. If you reflect a flap in a situation like this and you're not successful, you get even more recession than you did than you had before. And then, then the patient's really upset. So this is placed without disturbing, disturb, disturbing, without disturbing the marginal uh, gingiva. So you'll notice here at... Um, uh, by the time uh, our, we get to our final result, we have what's called creeping attachments. So these are the same exact crowns and everything. You'll get creeping attachment uh, to cover the re remainder of the implant, exposed implant and abutments. And it lasts. And it lasts because that tissue is so thick and keratinized and there's no more uh, pressure from the freedom attachments. So um, this is not unique to, to my case. You'll see this in natural teeth. Uh, a guy named... Uh, or, Author named Mate in uh, 1976 talked about creeping attachment on free gingival grafts. And uh, we see that now with, with the implants as well. So this is something that, that you'll see over and over and over, not just by me, but you'll see other clinicians do, the, do these quite a bit. So when we look at another case, here's a implant number 23. You'll notice radiographically, it's a really long implant. I don't want to cut it out just for, you know, just because we have three millimeters of recession. Um, we really want that covered. We want longevity. We want keratinized tissue. So once again, I, I went with a small free gingival graft. And look how small this thing is. It's like six millimeters long and maybe like four or five millimeters wide. So it's tiny. It's tiny. But you'll notice that it works at year one. It worked at year two. And then I lost track of the patient at year three, but she took a little bathroom selfie for me. And you can see that, that it is, it's there. You know, it's healthy, it's functional, it's comfortable, and it's going to last forever. So what do we do in the aesthetic zone? The aesthetic zone is a little bit different because here we've got recession on, on an incisor here. It shows when she smiles. In a situation like this, I'm going to tell you, you really got to tell the patient they need a new crown. Yeah, that, that's just what they're going to need, okay? Uh, because there's really no way to get, get this thing cosmetically pleasing with just soft tissue alone. Uh, part of the reason is that the tissue is thin. Part of the reason is that's very inflamed um, and it's not healthy, but there's no keratinized tissue. And then we also have a high freedom pool as well. So 
The interesting thing about these types of cases and having you all as my audience and, and having a, a social media presence on Instagram, what I get to ask what, what people would do. And when I asked what people would do for this implant, it was interesting because 52% of the people said they'd remove the implant. Uh, and then of the 50 of the 48% who wouldn't remove the implant, you know, 71% of them would have opted for a connective tissue graft. And uh, for me, um, I chose to do a free gingival graft. I, I totally went against the grain here. So here is the, the bed preparation. Once again, I'm trying not to disturb the papilla because if you reflect the papilla on a diseased implant, you're really asking for trouble because if things don't work out, a lot of times things can look uh, worse than they were before. So here is the free gingival graft and you'll see here, there's only four sutures interrupted. It does not have to be pretty, and not very precise at all, but this is what it looks like at two weeks. And this is at three months. So once, you know, with, with a polished collar on that implant, it's really hard to get attachment to it. So that's why I tell people, you know, you're really going to want a new crown uh, to fix to fix that, or at least a new abutment design or something. But this is what it looks like at a year, and this is her before. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, at one year, smiling. That's her before, and, and that's her after. So things look a ton better, a lot healthier appearance because of that thicker uh, and more uh, and pinker and healthier tissue. So the bottom line, when, before you decide whether you're doing a free gingival graft or a connective tissue graft or an acellular dermal graft or whatever, or if, even if you're going to decide on whether or not to keep the implant, you're going to want to take a CBCT and look at that facial plate. If you have a facial plate, then I would say if you have a facial plate and good interproximal height of bone, you can do whatever flat design you want. It's going to work. Now, they may not all take the, the, an equal amount of time to heal but they all eventually work. When you're like some of these cases, especially this one on the far left, where you have you know, a little bit of a dehiscence, maybe you have bone, maybe you don't. It's too hard to tell sometimes on CBCTs, but anyway, where it's questionable, you're definitely gonna want to tunnel you know, those flaps, especially in the aesthetic zone. And that's probably the, the biggest tip that I can give for you. When you're dealing with soft tissue around implants in the aesthetic zone, and you're trying to get root coverage Try to learn how to tunnel. That, that's going to be definitely worth your while to look to learn how to tunnel. And if I can't teach you that, I know Dr. Curry Levitt can at, at our course. But at any rate, learn how to tunnel because you don't want to leave a patient in, wor in a worse uh, situation than when you left and then when you found them. So in a situation like this, we have an implant number eight. It's got no issues except where the tissue is in chronically inflamed and just the color looks funny to where the patient hates it when she smiles. So in a situation like this, we're doing a connective tissue graft, okay? You pro I probably could have used anything, uh, including that free gingival graft, but because of her gummy smile, I liked her crown, she didn't want a new crown. I chose a connective tissue graft with a tunnel approach. Now, that's gonna be important because as we go from 2005 to 2018, you'll notice how stable that, that gingival margin is. With the connective tissue graft, we got a little bit thicker tissue, but you'll notice how pink and healthy it is. And that tissue still scallops uh, very, very nicely. I'll leave you guys with this last case. Um, here's tooth number or implant number eight. Patient is not happy with the abutment exposure, which is basically gingival recession around an implant. Not happy, man. She's refusing to have a new crown made for several reasons. One is her. This is her third crown. The first crown had a titanium above it, so you could imagine what you see now, except in silver. And then the uh, second crown she had was a gold above it, so imagine what you have now, except in gold. And this is her third one, and now it's white. So she says, "I've been paying for all these new crowns, but all I've gotten is." you know, either silver recession, gold recession, or white recession. So is there anything else we can do? And, you know, for me, honestly, if I was seeing her for the first time, I would just tell her to, to get a new crown and do a, a, a different abutment design. I think definitely we could, that would probably solve the majority of her problems. But anyway, this is, 
what I want to show you. So this is her periapical film. I can tell you her implant is placed really good. It's straight. There's no, there's no uh, major dehiscence. So we can do whatever we want, really, but I'm going to encourage everybody out there to, to do a tunnel type of approach around an implant. Um, because trying to try find this thing out or start over, that's like out of the question, in my opinion. I'm not, I'm not doing that. Um, but we have gingival recession. We have adequate keratinized and attached gingiva. There's no freedom pool. So to me, this is like an, I, if I'm going to have to work around an implant, this is pretty ideal for me. So what are the surgical versus restorative treatment options? Uh, that's what we just talked about. You can remake the crown, redesign the abutment, but we just went with just straight perio surgery. Earlier, I quoted a study and it said that, you know, people like the appearance of keratinized tissue better. And check this out. So in a survey here, we have just as much recession as I've been showing you, you know, the last hour, but now people want to fix it because it looks better. The tissue looks healthier. 89% of the people want to fix it. It's not surprisingly that 72% of the people who want to fix it still want to do a connective tissue graft. So in this situation, we went ahead with a connective tissue graft. Um, and I try to harvest it pretty thick here. Uh, I like to go with a single line incision. And that's what we're doing here is just going through a single incision in the palate. It goes pretty quick. I would say start to finish. Usually it's about a two to two to five minute harvest. So here we're, we're getting everything out uh, through a single incision line so that it can be nice and neat. And we can also suture the palate in this way. That way she's, uh, it's not left open. So uh, the recovery and, and pain and discomfort will be, uh, will be pretty minimal doing it this way. So here we'll free up that connective tissue. And you can see we've got a lot. I probably got way more than I needed, but I always say it's better to get too much than too little. Uh, in all reality, probably I needed half of that, but the more the merrier. As you can see, the palate, this is the way she left the office. It's very nice and neat and clean. Um, so anyway, we have to treat, just like we have to treat the root surface in order to get um, coverage, we also have to treat the abutment surface. So what I do is I like to, to just kind of level that with the burr and make, make the uh, abutment surface nice and flat. And then we'll smooth it up as well. But here's that tunnel flap. Uh, I think if I had to do it over again today, I would do a phrenectomy at the same time, um, but I didn't here. We just went straight up tunnel. And then we did a uh, coronal advancement of the, of the tissue and then just sutured it with chromic gut suture. This is what it looks like at three weeks. And then here we are at one year. At six months, it was already looking pretty good. And then you'll see so far, it's, it's pretty stable at a year. And I haven't heard back from her, so I'm assuming everything's good. I could totally be wrong, but even if I am wrong, that's when we go, hey, you know what? Change out the abutment, uh, redesign it. And you know we, we have plenty of thick tissue and it looks very uh, neat and healthy. So uh, patient's happy with this. So with that, guys, uh, just a real quick reminder, shoot me a message if you're interested in this two-day course in Las Vegas. Um, this uh, little deal they've got going on is going on through July 31st, so you have a few months to think about it or message me with questions. And with that, I thank you, and I hope you guys have a great rest of the evening, and I'll be taking a few questions for a few minutes uh, if you guys have any. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong, for that wonderful presentation. As mentioned, we will now open the floor up for any questions you guys may have. So if you have a question, please type in the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. So we have a few that came in. Um, first question, when do you use tax or pins to secure your graphs? Yeah, so I, I don't use tax or pins for me. Um, for And I'm assuming we're talking about bone graphs, that situation. Uh, for my bone graphs, the most I'll ever do is... is um, you know, periosteal anchoring sutures and maybe a tenting screw. Um, if if we're if we're talking about membrane and particulate grafts, uh, soft tissue grafts they don't ever get tacked, so they I don't worry about those at all. We just use sutures. Next question. So, what was the book that looked like a rainbow that helps make your decisions? Yeah, so that that book is called Implant Aesthetics, um, and that's from Dr. Dwayne Caratu. And that's awesome. spelled K-A-R-A-T-E-E-W, Dwayne Caratu. Great, thank you. All right, next question. How did you get the implants clean prior to 
free ging graft? A free gingival graft. So you get the implants clean, and in a situation like this, all I'll do is um, I don't. So I don't do any mechanical debridement. I'll just do a. Uh, I'll make a slurry with either tetracycline, you know, like a capsule of tetracycline or doxycycline, whatever you can get your hands on. I'll just put it in a little dappin dish, put some sterile water in it, and mix it all up. And then I, and I'll put some cotton pellets in it and just rub it over the implant surface for about three to four minutes. And that's how I clean it. Awesome. Um, in the case of FGG first and then bone graft in lower thin ridge case, if you do CTG, are we going to have more thickness to allow primary closure of GBR? <laughs> Blake, I, know so you're I apologize it. if I'm not answering <laughs> correctly. No, I totally get it. So um, it, it, in a situation like that, um, if you, if you tunnel with your seat with your connective tissue graft without with so so when you CTG without tunneling through the gingival margins, um, okay. So going back to that question, if you do a connective tissue graft underneath that, you do you take up a lot more space. So it's a little bit harder because connective tissue grafts well you typically have more fat and glandular tissue in it if you harvest it the way I did it. Um, you know, so it's going to occupy a lot of space. And I think for that, it's a little bit challenging because if you're doing trying to do a bone graft and a membrane and then try to stack a connective tissue graft off of that and then try to close it over with your flap, it's asking a lot sometimes. And sometimes in that area, that's too much tension and, and everything can fail. So that's why I like doing that free gingival graft first. It occupies a lot less space. Awesome. Thank you. All right, another one. When you CTG without tunneling through the gingival margins, as your case with the lower implant recessions, are you using any vestibular access techniques? Um, I, I don't. I don't like vestibular access techniques for the lower anterior. I'll do vestibular access techniques for the maxilla, but I'd say more commonly, I'll go through the midline frenum. That's the most common thing that I do. So it's it's a lateral access instead of vestibular. All right, next question. Under a lower anterior tooth bridge where there is only masuka under it, what type of graft do you use if you're redoing a tooth borne bridge? Under a lower anterior tooth bridge, where there is. Oh, so in a situation like that, I'm doing a free gingival graft. So I go up underneath that ponic as much as I can and I'll place a free gingival graft. For me, that, that's how I would do it. Then we have another question. Can you say one more time on the indication for each of FGG, CTG, and acicular dermis mitosis grafts? Sorry. Yeah, no, you're good. <laughs> so I do free gingival grafts. Um, so by location, I'll tell you this. Lower incisor is almost always a free gingival graft. Anywhere else, uh, I'll do connective tissue or uh, connect, uh, connective tissue is in play. For upper incisors, I, I'd say my most common is the acellular dermal grafts because it's just a little bit uh, simpler uh, for the patient. Now, as far as like what you're looking for in the surrounding areas, free gingival grafts are good for if you need a bunch of keratinized tissue and if you need to take care of a high freedom attachment. Connective tissue grafts are awesome if you want root coverage. Acellular dermal grafts are great if you want root coverage and already have thick tissue and you don't want to hurt the patient. So that's kind of the, the, the general breakdown. Perfect. How would changing the ap apartment help in the last case? Wouldn't the new crown just be too long in the same area? That's a great question. So when you change the abutment design, so this is really important because it's uh, that's a great question. It's a very common question. Most issues with abutment design. So the abutment, just first of all, it's supposed to be subgingival, right? Uh, if you can see it in the oral cavity, that's not a good thing. So by changing the abutment design, here's, here's what's going to happen. When you get recession uh, on an upper tooth, let's just say that the case that you're talking about, usually the, the, the abutment's too wide and the subcritical contour, meaning the, the part of the abutment that should be below the gum line, it's too convex. So by tapering it down and making it more flat or concave, by it, it will bring the tissue uh, more uh, incisal or more coronal. So that's how that's how that would that would have helped in that situation. Awesome. 
And then are you concerned about the scar tissue if FGG is done before ridge augmentation? Did scar tissue prevent you from doing aerosteel release? Um, so no, I'm not worried about the free gingival graft scar tissue, but the thing about that is, is you don't want a gigantic you know, free gingival graft or that will become an issue. So when you're doing that, a free gingival graft first, you just want to make sure that it's only, you know, six or seven millimeters wide. You don't want one of those big, you know, 12 millimeter long ones, you know, that. so you want to make sure that you don't over graft in that situation. Thank you. And then what size suture needle for the chrome gut sutures for these grafts? Uh, the chrome gut sutures, I use, so it's a, a 5.0, it's a 5.0 suture. And as far as the needle size, I don't even know. I'd have to go look at the package, but it's it's whatever is most common on a, on a 5.0, uh, on a 5.0 suture. Awesome. And then we got a compliment. As usual, great presentation. Greetings from UIC Perio. Hey, that's my, <laughs> that's the uh, University of Illinois, Chicago. Thanks, guys. Oh, I really appreciate it. Love really that. Appreciate it. So. Um, great. So it looks like those are all the questions we have for tonight. Um, thank you so much again, Dr. Wong, for that wonderful presentation. I we appreciate did, it. Yeah, thank you. Yes, we always appreciate having you. Um, we did record tonight's webinar and we'll email out the recording sometime in the next week. And we would appreciate your feedback via our survey that will pop up on the screen shortly. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you all for joining us. And we look forward to seeing everyone on future webinars. Thanks. Hey. Thank you. Hey, Blake, thanks so much. Thanks, Thank guys. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Night, everyone.